so here I am, and I really apologize. Um, that's the first time I've had that particular problem <laughs> with Zoom. Um, but anyway, it seems to be solved. I'm sorry to keep you waiting for such a long time. That's, a, that's okay, David. We've um, had time to talk about one or two things. Um, yeah. Well, it's fantastic to see you, David. And um, David's going to talk about his book, but I think he might want to say a few words first. Oh, yeah, yeah. you're going to talk. About, and we've got lots yeah. of questions ready for you. We, Good. We do, but, Thank but, well, just to slightly introduce David, um, okay. although we've arrived here um, presumably because uh, we're already familiar with David's work but David in um, a significant way um, introduced uh, Ilyenkov to a um, Western audience um, so now um, as a professor at um, Queen's he's not someone who ordinarily you might think would be uh, working in this sort of area um, of um, philosophy because his spe specialization is um, an analytic philosophy but what, what he provides is a really kind of unique lens on um, Ilyenkov, which makes his work um, accessible um, to those that might otherwise be sort of confused by um, it. He's um, excellent at contextualizing Ilyenkov's thoughts as well as um, showing some of the implications of his commitments and some of the resonances between his work and uh, that of philosophers that would be more uh, familiar to people in the um, Anglophone sphere. Um, he's been very influential um, on my own work. Um, so I'm excited uh, that we can have him here um, today, in, in part to talk about um, his exciting new book, which is uh, the collection of essays, one of which you've all been sent and have hopefully read. The book is The Heart of the Matter, Ilyenkov, Vygotsky, and the Courage of Thought. Over to you, David. Uh, thank you, Kirill, um, and thank you to everyone for coming. It's uh, amazing to see um, such a large uh, group um, to each talk about um, uh, my little paper uh, on Ilyenko's Hegel. Um, and so I thought what what I would do um, is just talk for a few minutes about um, the book and how it came to be, the heart of the matter, and then we'll just throw it open to questions if, if that's okay. And I'm happy to take questions on um, on the paper that you were sent, but uh, on any other aspect of the book or the broader context. I may not be able to answer them, but I'm I'm happy to to try. And there indeed may be other people present who can answer the things that I can't. So. Um, the the book, The Heart of the Matter, um, was published earlier this year, um, and it's a collection of largely uh, pre-published papers, though there are a couple of, um, uh, of new uh, writings. Um, uh, which uh, have not previously seen the light of day and uh, and not paid not sort of outtakes and things written ages ago that were discarded um, but um, uh, new things which I very much uh, stand by um, and there's there's also a paper on um, Vygotsky's conception of mediation that was published in, in Russian but never appeared in English so uh, an English version of that's included in the book um, the book doesn't include everything that uh, I've written on these thinkers. Um, the earliest paper that I wrote um, goes right back to 1982, and I didn't put that in, not because um, I reject it as an immature work, but because um, I wanted things to fit together appropriately. Some of the papers I wrote on Ilyenkov in the 90s, um, I felt overlapped, and so I chose a kind of selection from them and also missing are things which were written very recently uh, so there's a paper in um, the Palgrave handbook of Russian thought on Ilyenkov and the philosophy of thought I think it's it's called um, 
uh, which is my most recent thing, apart from the paper on Ilyenkov and Vygotsky on the imagination that I'm presently uh, finishing um, for a special issue that Karina and Kirill are editing on Ilyenkov uh, as part of the sort of Ilyenkov centenary celebrations. It's a uh, hundred years since his, his birth uh, next year. Um, so even though it's not everything there, there is nonetheless a sort of comprehensive um, collection of papers that kind of capture my work on Nilenko and Vygotsky and um, my efforts to place these thinkers against the background of Soviet um, philosophical culture. So uh, Andrei Maidansky, who I'm sure you most of you have heard of, is a, a Russian Ilyenkov scholar who's um, uh, done a great deal to preserve Ilyenkov's memory. He's presently sort of in charge of the Ilyenkov family archive, um, and uh, he's uh, played a big role in uh, editing the uh, collected Elenkov's collected works, which are gradually coming out in sort of ten or eleven fat volumes. Um, I think we're we're at volume eight now. I think. Um, well, Andre has written a, a review of the heart of the matter, and uh, he was kind enough to share it with me. And um, in this review, he he reminded me that um, when I started working on Elenkov, there was no book in English or in Russian on Vygotsky, let alone uh, Ilyenkov. There was just no literature at all. Um, James Wirch uh, published um, Vygotsky in the Social Formation of Mind in 1985. That was sort of the first Western um, uh, book on Vygotsky. Um, uh, and there was no book on Ilyenkov until Consciousness and Revolution, my um, book in 1991. Uh, there was no reliable history of Soviet philosophy. Uh, there were no published reminiscences uh, about these thinkers. Um, uh, so there was very little to go on. Uh, and I, I became interested in trying to find out what was going on in Soviet philosophy when I was an undergraduate back um, in the late 70s and early 80s at Kiel University in the Midlands of England. Um, and uh, apart from some Soviet logical literature on dialectical and historical materialism, there was pretty much nothing um, that was of any uh, help. Uh, and of course, if you were in the UK, there was only spotty amounts of, um, of literature, of, of sort of primary texts available in, in, in libraries. Um, so uh, the way I got into it was that I, I managed to make a trip to Moscow um, and uh, in order to meet um, <laughs> Russian philosophers, which is was not an easy task in the Cold War uh, era, um, but uh, through a series of very happy coincidences, I managed to make contact with um, Felix Mikhailov, a philosopher that many of you may have read, um, uh, and Felix basically said to me that if you can get if you can get back here for a period of time. Uh, I, Felix, will introduce you to everyone and um, help you find your way into this sort of very um, unfamiliar and quite sort of, in many respects, quite forbidding world of, of, of Soviet uh, philosophy. So that's what I did. When I finished my undergraduate work, I um, got the British Council to give me a year's studentship in Moscow, the sort of thing that would normally have gone to a sort of third year. PhD student um, 
but since I said I can't write a PhD on, unless I can do some primary research first, there's nothing to, to write about. Um, they, amazingly, for the British Council, which is quite a conservative organisation, as you could probably imagine, um, they bought this argument and sent me to Moscow for a year. And Felix Mikhailov was very much as good as his word and looked after me and introduced me to a lot of uh, people. Uh, and so that's how my work um, began. And the first chapter of the book, which is about Mikhailov, tells the story of how we, we met and, and how we worked together and so on. That's the easiest read in the, in the entire work. Um, I wasn't... Um, I mean, was I equipped to do this research? I had a degree in philosophy and in Russian studies from Kiel, but my Russian was very bad. And I, my background in philosophy is very much in the analytic tradition, so I was not steeped in German classical philosophy. So in some respects, I was quite ill-equipped. Um, but I had the advantage of um, the mentorship of Mikhailov, with who I got on extremely well with. I mean, there was a big age gap between he was 50 and I was 21 in 1980 when we first met. But we just really got on like a house on, on, on fire. And um, he was extremely well connected. Mikhailov was a friend, a close friend of Vilenkov's. And 1980 was, of course, the year after Ilyenkov's suicide. So uh, when I arrived on the scene, um, Ilyenkov's memory was uh, was very much in the forefront of um, everyone's mind. Um, uh, and so it was it was very natural for Felix. Um, uh, to so uh, as a, in the chat, Daniel. Uh, I asked which tradition I specialize in. Um, analytic philosophy, I broadly conceived. I mean, I, I just did a degree in philosophy in um, in the UK in, in the late 70s. And if you did that, you were being taught in the broadly analytic uh, tradition. So um, so in some respects, it was uh, disadvantage not to have been schooled in German classical philosophy. I mean, German classical philosophy is really, I think, a, a, a Russian term. It essentially means um, can Fichte, Hegel, <laughs> Marx. Um, um, so in some respects, that was a disadvantage. Um, Ilyenkov, of course, is a very historically oriented philosopher. He um, expresses a great, uh, many of his views through a narrative about the history of uh, philosophy, um, in which uh, Marx, Hegel, Spinoza are particularly, and Lenin are particularly prominent. Um, and I mean, to some extent, that reflects his historicist approach to philosophy. And in uh, another respect, it reflects the fact that um, in the Soviet context, it was very difficult just to sort of come out with your philosophical views. You had to kind of ventriloquate them through um, established figures or figures that were established within the tradition. Uh, and so uh, to write philosophy as a, as a series of variations on the work of Hegel and Marx was a very common way in which philosophers proceeded. Um, so it was tough for me to get myself into all of that in such a way as I could really get a feel for Ilyenkov's uh, thought. Um, but paradoxically, it was also kind of a strength, I think. It was certainly a strength that I was not um, attached to any particular form 
of Marxism that either in its British or in its, or in a European uh, version, let alone dialectical materialism of the Soviet kind. Um, I think had I uh, had I done an undergraduate degree in which I'd studied um, philosophy with the, the the British Marxists that were very prominent on the scene um, when I, I guess, 30 years ago, people like Chris Arthur or, or, or David Rubin, um, then I would have approached Ilenko with a certain set of preconceived ideas about what to make of his thought. Um, and in some respects, it was very good that I, I, I just wasn't signed up to any particular position. So I couldn't rush to judgment and I couldn't pigeonhole Lienkov into a particular style of uh, of thinking. So I really had to work my way into it with Mikhailov's help. I also had a lot of help from um, others. Uh, Vasa Davidov, psychologist, friend of Lienkov, friend of Mikhailov, who was, um, well, at least when I arrived in Moscow, was director of the uh, Institute of General and Pedagogical Psychology. Um, he uh, very kindly gave me essentially someone to help me with, with Russian. Um, so, so I learned Russian well by learning to write. Uh, so I would write papers. Mikhailov would set up little seminars, clandestine seminars, um, and I would record the proceed or the proceedings. Um, on a recording Sony Walkman that I had with me, it's just high tech in 1982. Um, and the fruits of, uh, of one of those sessions uh, is actually transcribed and appears as the second chapter of The Heart of the Matter. That's a long discussion. Some of you may know it. Uh, it's on, it's called Social Essence. Uh, what, what's it called? Um, I'll have to <laughs> social being in the human essence. That's right, um, which appeared in the nineties in studies in East European thought. Um, uh, that uh, that's a piece which never gets cited and people don't don't read it. But I, I'm quite proud of it in a way because it's one of the few texts that actually captures the sort of style of discussion that you find. So there's in this discussion there's Mihailov, Vladislav Lektorsky. Um, uh, Volodya Bibler uh, and um, Mikhailov um, and Davidov. So there's four main protagonists uh, and a couple of other people who chip in. Um, and I give a little paper um, that's somewhat limited in, and perhaps embarrassing paper. Um, and they all respond and they respond very much in the Russian style. That's to say, nobody asks little questions they um, reply at length and so you and, and they also spar with one another in a very um, human way uh, so uh, so that's how I um, that's how I worked I, we had several of these sorts of sessions um, and I was in, at Mikhailov's every week or two um, talking about philosophy or uh, Mikhailov was a great raconteur and so he would be happy to wax lyrical about different aspects of uh of philosophy in in russia um and i learned an, an amazing amount from just being in his company um a lot of what i came to know i therefore knew by hearsay um and it was quite difficult to corroborate a lot of what was said and um it, interestingly you know um as more and more material has come to light on um that whole era in soviet thought and on ilenkov in particular there are three fantastic books of archival material that ilenkov's daughter um put together uh, that were published started coming out i think in 2016 um uh, I, I look at those things with always with delight, but also with a certain trepidation that some view that I've taken, <laughs> something that I've said, is, turns out to be completely wrong. Um, but so far, things, uh, you know, have been okay. 
Um, Olga, interestingly, in the, the que question she sent, pointed out that in, in the Ilyenkos Hegel um, paper, I attribute, um, there's a remark that was made that I attribute to uh, Volodya Bibler, uh, uh, who Lektorsky told me had said that um, we, that is their generation, all came out from Il Ilyenkov's overcoat. That's a reference, an allusion to Dostoevsky's remark that uh, the writers of his generation all came out from Gorgel's overcoat. And there's a short story by Gorgel um, called the overcoat. <laughs> so hence, <laughs> uh, hence Dostoevsky's remark. So anyway, I quote this about um, uh, Ilyenkov's influence. Um, and Olga said, hey, actually, it was Eric Solovyov who said this and produced a beautiful uh, proof, of, proof of this in the form of a poem, <laughs> Solovyov, satirical poem um, uh, that Solovyov uh, ha had had written, in which he says it. I don't know, maybe Volodya Bibler said it as well or said it in uh, uh, an allusion to, to Solovyov's view, or, or perhaps... Vladik Lektorsky, who uh, I've known for many years, simply got mixed up. Um, but that such are the perils of working as I had to um, by sort of sitting down with people and chatting, uh, usually over a certain amount of vodka, I have to uh, confess. Um, so the paper Ilyenkos Hegel, uh, it's not really a, a commentary on Ilyenkos reading of Hegel, though I say a little bit about um Milenkov's thoughts on Hegel um but the idea is to sort of place Ilyenkov and, and also Bukharin um against the background of Hegel's place in Russian thought um whilst at the same time acknowledging the centrality of of, of Hegel to Ilyenkov's style of of, of philosophy so with that, I think I should stop talking and um, we'll throw things open to questions. Is that okay, Karina, Kirill? Is that, that's, that's good? Yeah, great. Um, I think Karina's going to first display a question that uh, was uh, sent in so we can read it in full before you uh, reply, David. Sorry, I've muted myself. Um, shall we go on to the, the question that I've got ready for you, David? I sent it to you by email already, but I've got it. I can put it on the screen because it's a bit long. This is from Lars. Yeah. No, this is from Lorenzo. Oh, okay. Um, I'll just share it now, and then here we go. That's it. Can you see that? Okay. Um, is it visible? Yeah. I need to move it, scroll it down a bit, do I? Can you see that all right? Uh, yeah. I, I... Can everybody see that all right? Okay, so um, I guess everyone's had a chance to to read that. So this is from um, Diego, is that right? De Diego Lorenzini? Are you there, Lorenzo? Maybe you could say hello. Oh. Maybe he's not there. Yes, yes he's he there. Is, yeah. Yeah. Lorenzo, you have to unmute, I think. What, or it, I think. He's there. He said hello in the chat. Okay. Yeah. 
And these holes yeah, are okay. very good. So, um, can I stop sharing? Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, well, you should leave it there for a little bit, okay. uh, Karina. Um, so it's, I mean, I'm I'm not really equipped to talk about um, sociology, or, but I I will say uh, this. Um, so Ilyenkov would certainly. So, certainly signs up to the view here attributed to Gramsci that human nature is um, not a biological or natural given, um, but a, a, it's a product of historical processes. Um, so for Lienkov, it's really central that human beings are self determining creatures um and he, he sometimes says um that 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 our form of self determination um is um Uh, is well, <laughs> it would be it would be crazy to say that it is unconstrained <laughs> by um, biological um, factors, um, and and sometimes Ilenko is very um, uh, keen to just admit that <laughs> straight off that um, you know human beings. Um, uh, do not naturally fly that insofar as we can fly we can fly in virtue of technology which we have created so um nonetheless the thought is that human human that the nature of human beings at any point in their history is a function of socio-cultural historical political factors uh, so there is no simply given human nature by appeal to which we can explain human agency. So that that's a view that's very central to um, Ilyenkov. Um, it was, I mean, thoughts of that kind were pretty prominent in the 1960s where debates about nature and nurture were very uh, central in uh, psychology and um, where uh, was they were often set up that the, the progressive side was strongly environmentalist um, and the um, more conservative reactionary side was much more centered on uh, human beings as uh, biologically constituted um, in ways which which significantly constrained their historical possibilities. Um, so you have to sort of see Lienko's particular style of expressing these views as in some ways influenced by the um, the idiom of the day. But um, nonetheless, uh, he was you know, profoundly um, concerned to um, argue um, for a, a positive thesis about um, humanity's powers of self-transformation in a very deep sense uh, and also to argue against all kinds of uh, views whether they showed up in politics or they showed up in education um, which uh, argued that you could explain some phenomenon about human activity um, by appeal to um, uh, biological constraints that human beings cannot do x or that these people fail to learn or that those students are uh, um, will essentially be held back in their in their learning because of um, uh, innate um, uh, qualities which no amount of educational re remediation could can deal with 
Um, and that's why for Yenkov, um, uh, the, uh, Mishirakov's uh, work with um, uh, deafblind students was enormously important to him because he felt that um, uh, the, the Mishirakov's remarkable successes with the education of students that were profoundly blind and deaf showed um, uh, that or was a, a testimony to the, um, the the significance of um, uh, his uh, his view of the social constitution of the self, but also that it was it was a kind of living uh, refutation of um, uh, of the idea that um, natural disabilities or natural constraints were always always imposed a ceiling on um, children's uh, development that could not be remediated by education. So, um, so Ilyenkov is very committed to, to that to that view. Um, I mean, maybe that's enough. Maybe I should stop talking and let people come in and follow up on that question. Does that help at all, Lorenzo? Or am I just telling you what you already know? Sorry, not Lorenzo, it's Diego, right? Sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> okay, um, so do raise your hands if you have a question, preferably using the hand raising icon on Zoom. Paul, to start us off. Okay. Is Ivan in Sigurd? No, Paul's first, yeah. He's oh, sorry. Yeah. Paul's muted. No, uh, no uh, well, he, oh, I'm sorry, there's two Pauls. Himself. Yeah. Is, it, is that okay? Yeah. yeah, I'm Paul. Yeah, hi there, David. Good to see you again. Um, just a, a couple of questions, really. I've got a couple more, but perhaps in because of question of time, we can leave those out. But um, first of all, you um, uh, it's interesting your comments about Terry Pinkard in uh, that essay, um, because you said, this is what you say in the essay, it's a matter of contention whether Ily Ilyenkov would have had sympathy for Pinkard's rendition of the problem, let alone endorse his account of a solution. But there is no doubt that, the, that these re uh, respective approaches can be brought into dialogue um, in a way that is of enduring interest. And uh, I was quite taken by that, the way you pose that, because on the one end, you seem to be saying um, uh, that um, there's a problem with um, uh, Terry Pinkard's interpretation from a Ilyenkov point of view, but in another way, they, in another sense, they can be brought into dialogue with each other. So could you kind of elaborate what you was actually meaning there? What, what does that actually mean? <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, okay, so um, so the way I read Ilyenkov on the ideal is that really I mean, among the things that's going on in Ilyenko's work on the ideal is an account of the source of what in um, Western philosophy recently has been called the sources of normativity. So mm -hmm. as it were, what um, what is the origin of the space of reasons? <laughs> right? If you put it like that. Um, uh, and uh, Ilyenko's view um, is that you cannot understand the space of reasons or you cannot understand the nature of normative constraints on human beings, normative constraints of all kinds, um, unless you see them as essentially related to human activity. All right? So, I mean, that's a skeletal way of putting it. So, so you've got this issue about the nature of norms, reasons, concepts, categories, rules um, and you've got an answer about how these things are possible which appeals to human activity 
Now, a view of that kind can take various forms. So you could have a strong social constructionist view that was deflationary, that said that all there is to uh, the appearance of there being a reason to do this or to think that is just. And then there's some story about um, the fact that these things are endorsed by human cultures and communities or something of this sort. Um, or you could have a view which said that, that I mean, norms take different forms and the influence of norms over those who respond to them can be of different kinds, but you cannot understand the, them unless you understand it in relation to the life activity of the beings that are, are so moved by these norms. Now, I think Ilyankov holds the latter view rather than the former heavily constructivist deflationary view. Um, okay, so um, Terry Pinkard is a Hegel scholar, very good one. <laughs> and um, so they, they're emerged in the writings of Pinkard and also I think Robert Pippin, a sort of view about um, the interest of Hegel's views with respect to questions about the sources of normativity, because um, in Kant, you get the view that um, there's a sense in which we are free in virtue of the fact that we conform to norms that we give ourselves. That's a that's a Kantian view. Um, we are self-legislating beings. Um, I mean, this is a the form of Kant's view about the nature of moral authority, but it also it could apply more broadly um, to rationality in in general. Um, but this Kantian view presents a paradox because um, on the one hand, we have to be um, the source uh, of, well, on the one hand, our freedom consists in the fact that we give the norms to ourselves, but the norms have to have some genuinely authority. This is the, the point. It can't just be arbitrary because there's no freedom in, in imposing upon yourself norms that are completely arbitrary. So you, you must be responding to norms that have some kind of genuine norm of authority. And if that's the case, then the problem is that you can't, we can't be solving the problem about the nature of normative authority by saying, well, we give these norms to ourselves because they only works if the norms have an independent authority. That's the... That's the Kantian paradox, uh, according to Pinkard, and the Hegelian solution appeals to the to sociality, that in some sense, there is a we at stake that gives the norms to, to um, ourselves and to those individuals who, as it were, enter the space of reasons. Okay, so there's certainly a parallel between that view and Ilyenkov's. But Ilyenkov's view um, has a different sort of feel to it because it's not focused entirely on the notion of reciprocal recognition as tends to play out in the Pinker version of Hegel, I think. Um, it's focused more on the material <laughs> creation of a cultural reality that embodies a kind of normative presence that any individual who enters into human life has to take on and engage with in the course of acquiring human mental powers. Now, okay, so what I wanted to say in this paper is, um, look, Ilyenkov, uh, I mean, it's not the case we've got some obscure um, Soviet Marxist uh, whose views are, are sort of um, 
distinctively interesting but distinctively peculiar i mean i wanted to say look this what Ilyenkov is doing here engages very centrally with the sorts of things that are being discovered in a way in um uh western hegel scholarship right now uh, and um but i i didn't feel that i could I, I didn't have space and nor did i feel i had the competence to say okay this is exactly how we should locate Pinkard in relation to Ilyenkov. I think there would have been an interesting conversation between them. Um, uh, and uh, later in the book, there's I have a couple of other discussions that skirt around this issue, perhaps not very satisfactorily. But that's what I, want, I wanted to say. I wanted to say, look, this is this Ilyenkov is a live figure in this debate, actually, if you know how to read him. Um, and it may be that the solution that he offers is. Um, is better philosophically, and it might be more faithful to Hegel than what um, is being, what is manifest in Terry Pinkard's view. But um, yeah, so that's what I was trying to say. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good answer. I mean, really, I suppose the only way we can um, assess it is to do a thorough reading of Pinkard and a thorough reading of Ilyenkov and, and do a comparison. Um, and, you know, one of the problems that I think we're in at the moment is that it's still Ilyenkov's studies are still very new, uh, even though he died so long ago. There's there's not a lot of people in the field. And, um, you know, but can I just uh, just just I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get two for one here, but just just um, <laughs> bung in another question. Um, but later on in the article as well, you take a bit of a pop at Engels, which of course is fair enough. Um, why, why shouldn't you? Um, but I, I, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Engels because, um, in a way, he, he come, you know, he, he he takes he's the butt of a lot of attacks, really, uh, to do with philosophy. And um, what's happened in more recent years is there's been a more um, adaptive approach to dialectics overall. Um, I'm thinking here of people like Jonathan Bellamy Foster, for example, the, the American writer who um, in his books on Marxism and the ecology, um, he talks about dialectics, not as laws, not as three laws, but he talks about them as ontological paradigms, which I think is a much, much better way of putting it. Um, but also as well, Bellamy Foster and also the economist Anwar Sheikh uh, both talk about this new, you know, relatively new concept of emergence, the whole way that so many people today are going about emergence. Uh, as really being dialectics. And I thought that was a really interesting adaption of a modern kind of discourse that we have in the West. Everybody talked about emergence. Um, when, you know, um, Amar Sheikh in one of his videos, he says, well, back in the old days, we just used to refer to it as dialectics, you know, <laughs> which I kind of really quite quite loved his, um, his candidness about it. Um, but I suppose what I'd say to you, I'd ask you really, is do you think that had um, Ilyenkov live today he would have um thought you know he would have embraced that idea of emergence and um uh, and the modern kind of adaptions uh given um, all the all, all the way that the dimat sort of thing uh, somewhat collapsed in the soviet union with the fall of the soviet union itself or got severely criticized you know yeah okay th yeah thanks i mean i'm i'm not um i'm not familiar enough with the the views that you're um, referring to, to be able to say what Ilyenkov's view would have been. Um, certainly on Engels, um, yeah, I mean, I I have a, a, a recently graduated doctoral student who some of you will know, um, Rogni Piedra Arancibia, um, who is very much an Engels scholar and thinks that Engels is much maligned uh, and that this is a uh, a disgraceful misreading of a very important uh, figure. And, um, you know, I have to say that you know, in terms of, you know, Rogner's view that um, people are quick to rush to judgment about how to how to read Engels. And if you people spend anything like as much attention on what Engels thought, and any anything like a, as much charity in reading him that you find with well with Ilyenkov actually but in 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 my case or uh, in Marx um in many cases uh 
then you would take a, a more uh, sympathetic view and there's all kinds of riches in, in Engels. So when I was re Rogney's not here, sometimes he, I thought he might show up to this meeting and be able to give me a hard time in, in public. So knowing that he would, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that he would complain about this remark uh, about Engels and, and, you know, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the general question about what Elenkov would have thought today, that's an extremely difficult question to answer, actually, because Elenkov, um, I mean, I mean, this is something that many of you in the group may have views about. Um, because on the one hand, uh, Elenkov, uh, I, I think, seemed quite a fresh thinker to many people um so um i mean th th there must be <laughs> there must be some reason why um you know there's however many 32 people <laughs> at a, in in 2023 at a talk about the soviet marxist who died in 1979 so you um he seems quite a fresh thinker in in, in many ways but on the other hand he was very much um uh centered on his on his time and, and his career was incredibly productive early on um and then as i mean this story is retold in that chapter then as as circumstances in the soviet philosophical world worsened and opportunities for creativity lessened he becomes much more of a, a thinker sort of struggling to preserve a message or struggling to keep a, a sense of or authentic culture of philosophical scholarship centered onto what he saw as, uh, as authentic authentic marxism um and so he's so preoccupied with that that it, it's hard he doesn't come across as a thinker who's going to be sort of open to all kinds of novelty and, uh, and and new forms of thinking. He's too preoccupied with trying to get people to understand what the classics of Marxism was supposed to be about. Uh, so and that's not to say that he, you know, uh, had he lived much longer, he would not have evolved and welcomed in a different sort of philosophical environment. Um, it's just really difficult to imagine Ilyenkov not fighting the battles that he constantly found himself having to fight. Thanks, David, and thank you, Paul, for your question. I'm just going to come to Karina and then to Sigurd. Thank you, Kirill. Um, Sigurd has kindly allowed me to jump in here. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, in response partly to the last points that David's made and the questions to him, um, that as, as we heard in David's account of his own experience, um, he was an initiator of um, actually introducing Ilyenkov to non-Russian non readers, which was an incredible thing to do at the time. He, as, as he said, it wasn't, it was unknown, that whole area was unknown because of basically partly language and partly the writing off of all philosophy in the Soviet Union as being um, pretty useless um, because people didn't know what was going on. Um, and I, I, that, what's well, amazing to think this was, we're talking now 20, 32 years ago when David's first big book came out. So we, we, we've seen a, an incredible kind of evolution since, a revolution in a way, in understanding and appreciating Ilyenkov. And the question is, as, as David said, why is it that, why is it that this has happened when, um, Considering history and considering everything, why is this? Why is he remain? Why has he become so attractive now at this time in history? You know, I, I think it does go back very much to the um, the whole question of what is human relationship to nature and to to the world. What is our relationship to the world? What is the relationship of our thought to the world and our practice? Which is what Vilenkov was. Um, this, you know, investigating, and as as indeed um, 
this chapter that we were reading raises this question in relation to Ivyenko's attitude to Hegel. You know, I, that is the that is the, the the whole core of it. I think it's very significant that um, for the first time, really, um, Ilyenkov's relationship to ecology is being discussed. Um, unfortunately, I think Isabel just had to leave, but she did actually present a paper, at, and she's written about Ilyenkov, Ilyenkov's philosophy in relation to ecology, Ilyenkov's ecology, human social ecology, and not only Isabel, but also Visa Oitinen, who's a a long-standing elenco pioneer has I'm written he, he presented a, a brief paper on that question so why is it that this is suddenly so important because precisely because of the, the global ec ecological social human crisis how to deal with that and that elenco does provide a different a different approach to that and, and, and well in in the view of those of us who agree with elenco that's that's his the core of his thought, really. I think, um, and and uh, you know, th anyway, that's we we are experiencing actually a kind of renaissance for the and I think that's that's why we've got everybody here tonight. Um, anyway, that's me. Yeah, just a quick correction. Isabel's paper wasn't about human ecology; it was about ecology as such in the John yeah. Bellamy Foster sense. And, uh, yeah. And, oh, sorry, could I just come back with one point briefly in relation to Paul S Simons? Um, I, I don't think that the uh, concept of um, emergence has got, I think it's a perversion of Ilyankov, actually. I don't think it's, it's not, a, it's, it's, a, it's a watering down and a, um, it's really nothing to do with um, dialectics. Well, it is, but it's a, a kind of perversion of it, in my view. <laughs> I'll have an, art, an article Hopefully soon, arguing the opposites. Sibio, it's over to you. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, and um, um, what I would like to uh, say is that uh, uh, <clears throat> um, well, personally, uh, I'm in Oslo, Norway, and uh, I... Uh, 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 I, 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 it was very interesting to hear uh, David's uh, account of him uh, discovering so early as in the 80s uh, Soviet philosophy, uh, having interest in Soviet philosophy. So I, I would very much like to know uh, more, uh, uh, if you could uh, say something more, David, about, because I didn't really get uh, what... Uh, Triggered uh, this interest when you are in the analytical tradition, you don't have uh, this uh, Marxist impulses, as you say, and uh, and, uh, and how come <laughs> as, as, uh, in, 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 uh, during the Cold War in the eighties that you you get this interest of Soviet philosophy? I I would like to say that in, for myself, I'm I'm a bit younger, so it, I was a student in the nineties, uh, and. Um, uh, I, I'm a, an, I'm, an, uh, I'm studying Russian language, uh, but it was through uh, this uh, philosophy and uh, uh, Paul Feuerabend, uh, reading Paul Feuerabend, his uh, Against Method. Uh, uh, it was the first time for me uh, to uh, how he treats this uh, so Lenin, this tradition as philosophers. I mean, this is not a part of the curriculum. So what I was uh, interested in was uh, and made a master thesis in, in Russian uh, culture studies was how was this uh, received in, in the Soviet Union? And uh, in this way, I also had a couple of nice days in Moscow and, and, and I stumbled into the same area, but I found myself very alone. And it was a very hard time to uh, convince any professors at the University of Bergen or Oslo that it's even uh, something to study there, you see? So, so I'm a little bit puzzled, uh, David. How come uh, an Englishman at, at, uh, in, uh, in, as early in the 80s can, uh, can get this revelation? And I, I also guess that you must have been quite alone uh, as an English student. Like I also find for myself when I was in Moscow in the late 90s. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. And, I, and I'm still, so, so, so I'm sorry I was a bit lengthy, but I hope that the question is, um, is clear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
All right. So um, I, I think, I mean, a, a lot of the reasons why I um, fell into this, uh, this field um, was, I'm sorry, I'm just adjusting the, the view on my screen. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the reasons why I fell into this field were pure contingencies. So uh, as an undergraduate, um, I, I, I went to university to study English and music. Um, but Kiel was a very unique institution in the British university scene at the time because it, it had a four year, not a three year degree. And in the first year, you had to study all kinds of stuff that you hadn't studied in school. So I started studying philosophy and I really liked it, partly because I had a really good tutor a guy called Jonathan Dancy, who became a very distinguished philosopher. Um, and he was just thrilling to work with. So I suddenly got in philosophy. I wanted to do philosophy, but you couldn't timetable philosophy and music, right? So that's the first contingency. <laughs> so I, I had to find something else. The English department was very boring, I thought, um, at the time. So, uh, and, but I did a little bit of work in the Russian department and, um, I thought that it was the Russian department of Kiel was fantastic at the time. Um, it had a wonderful um, Russian emigre expert on the poetry of Joseph Brodsky, Valentina Paluchina. She was fantastic to, to work with. And they had an uh, intellectual historian who was the chair of the department, Zhenya Lampert, who'd written wonderful books, one on Belinsky, one on this sort of R R Russia of the 1840s, so uh, Belinsky, Bukharin, and uh, Herzen, and he had written a subsequent book on um, Chernyshevsky and Tisarev and Dobrelubov, the men of the 60s. Uh, and uh, he, he was a very philosophical thinker. He translated uh, Berdyaev, and he, all of these, this history of Russian thought in the 19th century was very philosophical. I mean, all of these, these thinkers, like the names I reeled off, all, they weren't philosophers in the academic sense, but they all had deep philosophical views. And of course, Russian literature was, I mean, is uh, <laughs> Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, it's full of philosophy. So, um, so here I am doing a joint degree in an interdisciplinary university before interdisciplinarity was fashionable. And so the natural question, how, okay, how do you put this together, <laughs> right? So what about Russian philosophy? Um, and so my immediate thought is it can't be true that a culture as in philosophically intense as Russia has no philosophy of merit going on in it. It's just impossible. So I wanted to find out, the only way to find out was actually to go there for reasons <laughs> and and then I met Mikhailov, again, the story is told in chapter one, um, uh, and um, he was not just wonderful to do, but, but he gave me so much time. And in part, he could give me a lot of time because this is a period known as the period of stagnation. Um, and that was true in the sense that no one in Russian institution, the Institute of Philosophy or the Institute of Psychology, no one had anything to do. Uh, There's a lot of sitting around talking. Um, plus, you had a philosophical culture that was intensely oral for the reasons of censorship and the difficulties of publishing. The real work went in na kuchni, as they say, in the kitchen. And so it was um it was very easy to sort of fall into that world but, and um i mean they welcomed me and that was the thing i mean it would have been very lonely if i hadn't had Mikhailov as just working in libraries it would have been impossible but um it really all depended on that constant human contact and living in this sort of environment of ideas with people who are going to talk about, you know, what Ilyenkov was really all about or what happened in the 20s and 
um, how we should read Vygotsky. I mean, Vygotsky at the time, no, this is before the Vygotsky's selected works were published. I mean, the, the six volume collected works, um, they weren't published yet. Right? The only thing we had in English was thought and language in its intensely abbreviated version. Um, and the uh, mind in society, which Mike Cole and others had sort of culled together from little bits and kind of reworked to make it acceptable to Western psych. That was all there was. Um, and in Russian, it was, wasn't much better because there was a collection of Vygotsky from the late 50s, but not much else. Um, so it, everything, the whole philosophical culture was centered in, in conversation, in speech, in debate in and i love that um and um it was just luck that um you know people let me <laughs> let me let me play <laughs> so that's really what what happened and so that, it, it's quite fascinating because you know we're used in the marxist tradition to be thinking about grand historical developments and the laws of history and so on. But all of this came about because of people. I mean, I did philosophy because I liked Jonathan Dancy. I did Russian because I liked Eugenia Lampert. I, I could continue with this work because Felix and I were friends. Otherwise, none of it would have happened. I mean, of course, it's not a grand historical <laughs> project. It's just a guy writing some academic work. But it, it, it really was a matter of contingencies. And I had a backup plan. If it had fallen apart, which it could have done at any minute, I would have gone to Oxford and written a PhD on or defil on something else. Wittgenstein was the flavor of the month at, at the time, and so I would have written on Wittgenstein, like many of the philosophers of my generation did. And I'm just, you know, people for, constantly told me I'd never get a job if I kept going with this, and I'm glad that they were, were wrong, and I'm very glad for the continued interest in, in, in Ilyenkov, which is amazing and of course it's no more than he deserves <laughs> but uh it is nonetheless given the course of world history uh, since his death it, it is really amazing how how the work of an orthodox marxist leninist or but in his own lights uh, or authentic marxist leninist it still gathers such interest today yeah thanks for your question i'm sorry my answers are very long but um but there you go <laughs> i'm sorry you. just me Okay, um, we will take the next three questions together and then, um, David, if you could yeah, address those ones, uh, the third one. Um, so Ivan first. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, David, for your introduction to the paper and your answers so far. Quick question about Plato, actually. So it, it's... Um, your essay is a nice essay about showing um, how Ilyenkov uses Hegel. Um, and also you mentioned a little bit showing how Ilyenkov and Hegel um, use Kant. How they, I think you say, um, historicizing the forms of intuition and the categories. <clears throat> and um, I wondered about Plato. I've got a Somehow I got a reading list that Ilyankov wrote in 1970 for his students at MGU. And about Plato, he says, Citat i Procitat Scarandashem. Sio, sio. And sio is uh, in bold. So. so he's really keen on Plato. And I wondered if you could uh, explain is this just. You know, all philosophers like Plato, or is there something about the ideal that um, Ilyankov is interested about Plato, or is it something else? Thanks, and Ralph. Should do you want me to answer that? Um, no, it, um, no. We'll, we'll hear the question from Ralph and Suresh, and then okay, yeah, still muted, Ralph. Is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm just going to ask one of eight possible points I was going to bring up, because I read three of your chapters in the intro, and I've been discussing these things with people for, here for the past couple of years, but about the question of, of, of what Hegel accepted 
I'm sorry, what Ilyenkov accepted and rejected regarding to Hegel, which I reread last night, but my short-term memory is bad. So as I recall, uh, he was willing to accept a lot of, of Hegel and Hegel's uh, themes, but just rejecting, I think it was the absolute spirit in substituting for that the collective activity um, of humans as, as a collective uh, uh, totality. And I'm wondering what you think about sort of the adequacy uh, of that, because from what because it was what he seems to be doing is different from simply the orthodox Marxist view of turning Hegel on his head. Mm -hmm. There's something different, but yet at the same time, he seems to be accepting a lot, even from your description. And I wonder if you think that it's it's adequate, because it seems to me that the problem with with idealism or the problem with with guys is not simply um, that the point of origin of your analysis is wrong, but I think that it 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 distorts your categorical your categorical, categorical analysis of, of empirical reality. And just to take a simple example, if you look at the philosophy of history, you know the Orient, one is free. Ancient Greece, some are free, and the modern Christian, all are free. That kind of stuff has to go. That's not a way of analyzing history. And of course, the young Hegelians made it even worse, which is why one of the things that Marx attacked about some of the ridiculous uh, adaptions of these ideas. So I don't recall Ilyenkov, from what I've read, getting into that aspect, but it seems that the distortion of the categorical, categorical understanding of the empirical world is a problem. Um, and I'm not, I don't recall whether he addresses that and the adequacy or inadequacy of Hegel in putting together a systematic view uh, of reality on that. So I wonder what you could say about that. Okay, thank you. If you really want to take- Oh yeah, sorry, I'm so sorry, when we are. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, you know, there is, an, uh, there is another philosopher who has engaged with Hegel and he has also tried to, you know, develop a materialist dialectics and a kind of task, which, you know, the task which Elienkov also did. I'm talking about Althusser. So how do you think, you know, the, uh, the how Althusser, you know, redefines and uh, that redefines or tries to develop materialist dialectics and how Ilyenkov does this. Do you see any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of convergence or parallel between the two philosophers or are they really, de you know, just developing two very different kind of materialist dialectics which have no, you know, nothing in common? Okay. So okay. There's, one, there's one more hand up. Karir, do you want um, to take that question too? And I'll try and do all four. Oh, okay, sure. Yanis, go ahead. Uh, hello, David. Thank you very much Hi. for your for your talk. And uh, I really can't wait to read your book. Um, so I want to. The, my question is the following: Since in your article uh, on, on Hegel, uh, you make some connections and uh, you associate uh, Ilyenkov's thought with contemporary scholars in Hegelian studies, such as Picard, McDowell, and so on. Uh, uh, I'm thinking that it might be worth discussing also, or to tell us a few a few words uh, about uh, what would be, uh, what, what would have been Yankov's approach on the recent uh, debate between Pippin and uh, Hulgate, which can be semantically depicted, depicted as a debate between the epistemological interpretation of Hegel and the ontological interpretation of Hegel. I, I see, and uh, in which part uh, probably Ilyenkov uh, would have joined. I say this because, as everyone knows very well here, Ilyenkov's contribution to philosophy and dialectics in the Soviet Union was largely shaped by Diamat's, by his confrontation with Diamat's ontology. So, in this sense, the recent debate on Hegel, uh, on, on the Hegel uh, academic academia, uh, has, to, it, it seems to me that it has some similarities, although it has great uh, differences, but it seems that it has some kind of similarity with the, with the, with the period that Yankov uh, uh, developed his, uh, his approach on dialectics. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, back to you now, David. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> are we stopping at two, at, um, at 7.30? Is that the plan? Well, we, well, so if you can go, 
a little bit over because we started a little bit late that would be great sure yeah um yeah I, that's fine by me and i'm sorry for giving such long answers that we only got through some of the questions but um okay so i i, I um yeah okay so first um Ivan's question um, on Plato. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. It's quite uh, interesting. I mean, in Ilyenkov's writings, uh, there isn't that much discussion of Plato. I think I'm I'm pausing in case I'm forgetting something um, it, it, important. I mean, he's um, a, very little about Aristotle. So uh, um, I, I'm really, I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, um, not just because, of course, Plato is a very rich philosopher and Certainly, if this is a reading list Ilyenko put together for his students, then uh, you could just imagine um, uh, how he might feel that, you know, if you're going to do some real philosophy, it's good to step away from this narrative, which is everywhere about the evolution of Marxist philosophy. It, through modernity uh, and get come to grips with the kind of um philosophical questions that we find in plato um whether he sees the plato as uh introducing the very questions about the nature of the universal, the nature of concepts, the realm of the ideal, um, and that that's the interest. I'm not sure. It could very well be, or or whether the um, sort of the Socratic tradition of philosophical dialogue and dialectic in that sense was what was important to him. I don't know. It'd be interesting to ask Andrei Maidansky whether there's some in the Ilyenkov archive. There's some writing on. Plato, which is not sort of just part of the standard picture of the history of philosophy uh, uh, that Ilyenkov usually paints. So that that's my only answer that I have there. Um, the second question from Ralph about um, Ilyenkov's reading of Hegel. Um, I don't think it, it, it's quite right to say that, well, you know, Ilyenkov wants to get rid of the concept of absolute spirit um, and replace it with, or to humanize it. As, I mean, to some extent, of course, he does. Um, but I think he certainly wants to get away from a view that. Um, the appropriate <laughs> that the we need to see the appropriate way to see Hegel and the relation Hegel and in the Marxist tradition is that Marxism stands Hegel on uh, the other the, the right way up as it were that Hegel is a, is simply an inverted picture. Alenkov does not believe that he thinks that. Um, I mean. I think I, I would put it, he, he could never have put it like this, but I think he, he thought it that really you've, you, you just need to make certain kinds of adjustments to Hegel's thinking in order to end up at the right position. Um, and that the, once you see that, as it were, the vehicle of Geist is embodied living communities of, or communities of living embodied uh, 
human beings, then the rest of the story, you can keep a great deal of it just so long as you get the accents right. So um, that, that's, I think, I I I Ilyenkov's view. I was rereading before this session the, the chapter on Hegel in dialectical logic. It's really worth rereading it <laughs> because uh you know it's all about what's right about hegel's view of logic uh which is in some sense code for what's right about hegel's philosophy as such um but it, it it's an extremely con difficult issue because um as I say in the paper, Ilyenkov is constantly being attacked for his Hegelianism, that um, uh, the perils of being called an idealist in Ilyenkov's world were very significant. And so um, it's really important for Ilyenkov to, uh, I mean, it's quite brave of him to constantly be wanting to redeem as much of Hegel as he possibly can um, and to adopt positions which have a significant subtlety about them. So he, he's not going to come out and say something crass about um, Hegel's idealism. He, in fact, he wants to, he really wants to say, look, look, you don't understand what idealism is, you people. <laughs> um, um, uh, and that there's a great a deal of truth in an idealist position. We just need to modify certain parts of it. That's the Ilyenkov view, and he's constantly citing Lenin's notebooks, of course, everything you can find in Lenin's notebooks, which recognizes the the um, intelligence of Hegel's view, he, he, he cites. Um, Suresh's remarks about Althusser, again, it's always very difficult to try to locate Ilyenkov with respect to Western Marxists, contemporaries. Um, because of course there's very little opportunity for dialogue or whenever um, Soviet thinkers write about Western Marxists, they're almost always scathingly critical. <laughs> so, um, uh, so uh, you know, I think, um, I, I, I think one of the striking things about Ilyenkov is that there is a, there's an element of humanism in his work, and there's also an element of, well, individualism is the wrong word, but he really cares about individuals. If you're writing, if you're, sorry, if you're reading his work on education, it's very, very clear that he cares about real individuals and that there's some sense in which you know that has to be the the, in the the well being of human individuals that has to be the focus of marxism and not some world historical story so there are elements in althusser which i think he would have recoiled from it, it, uh, for that reason um and then um yeah so the the um Giannis is uh question about the contemporary another aspect of the contemporary debates of uh about hegel um yeah so uh, i don't know what ilyakov would have said with respect to this pippin holgate debate which um uh i, I remember reading you know back when i was or um when i was writing this paper or sh shortly thereafter because i think it's sort of contemporaneous with with that um Ilyenkov typically is not is not happy with absolutizing a distinction between ontology and epistemology he does not like to do that so if he's um He's not someone who says, look, there are ontological issues and then there are <laughs> epistemological issues and they are, these are quite separate domains. Um, rather, he's someone who's suspicious of that distinction as it gets deployed. So I think he, um, 
he would probably have resisted at least that way of setting up the issue of the interpretation of of Hegel. Um, but that's a superficial answer, and I would need to think a lot more about it. But um, I don't know. Do you have any views on, on it yourself, Jonas? You're muted. Uh, it's complicated debate. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a topic for may, may is a maybe a topic for a further uh, session. I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's obviously a complicated matter. I'm I'm not sure. I me too. I'm not sure what the Yankov would have choose today on this contemporary debate. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So uh, we will just do last question from Lars, and then it'll be back to Karina. Yeah, hi David. Um, I sent you the questions in advance, and I think I, I will shorten my question, which is pretty long. But um, uh, you say in your paper that, that Ilyenko's concern is to transcend philosophical conceptions that think of the relation between mind and reality as one between two worlds, or for that matter, Popper's three worlds. So in, in um, <clears throat> doing so, then it turns to Kant's a priori forms of intuition. Um, but then he realizes that Kant himself finds up the, in two worlds, the phenomenal world and the numenal, numenal world, the world of experience and the world of, of things in, in itself, the, the way the, the reality really is. And he says then that, um, uh, we must historicize the categories. The fundamental forms of thought are not given a priori, but are realized historically as social consciousness. So it seems then that Elienko asserts that the fundamental form of thinking uh, categories are determined by the universal norms of that culture within an, which an individual vacants to conscious lives. So uh, uh, my question then is that um, uh, the universal, the norms of a culture are certainly not no universal, you know, because each culture has its own uh, norms that sort of, uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> in which the individual vacates to conscious life. So, so what, what, what does uh, Alienko really mean by by the universal in this sense? Uh, okay, thanks, Lars. Um... Yeah, so I don't think um, okay. So I I I don't think the appeal to um, the, the the idea of historicizing the categories is supposed to introduce an element of cultural relativity. I mean, it might introduce an element of cultural re relativity, but um, I think that Ilyenkov believes that um, the character of human life activity itself in engagement with the material world um, will ensure that um, a human human forms of thought that are are born by culture in the sense that each generation has to as it, as it were inherit uh, these forms of thought um, uh, as they're initiated into language and and social practice. Um, I think he thinks that it's going to be a characteristic of human forms activity that the, the sorts of very basic categories, subject, object, identity, causation, and so on, that forms the structure of Kant's categories, um, these are going to be universal. Um, of course, they they're real 
sort of empty categorical form <laughs> is going to may be universal, but the specific character that these concepts take on in self-conscious human activity will show cultural variation. Mm. So as science develops, so the concept of causation is going to be um, increasingly refined and uh, and so on. And that may well, um, there may well therefore be cultural variation, um, but it doesn't, the cultural variation doesn't show up at the level of simply being able to think this brought about that, right? So, um, so the historicism of the categories is not supposed to mean that they vary dramatically through history in their most fundamental form. It's that um, they are not part of the innate architecture of the mind. This goes right back to the first question that I tried to deal with. They are, as it were, something that is culturally transmitted as children are initiated into what I, following McDowell, call the space of reasons, and uh, or you might call social practice or culture or, or whatever. Um, so that's that's really the view. I think the longer version of your question, you're, you're basically saying, well, um, you know, Kant, we, Kant thinks of the categories as part of really of the innate architecture of the mind. Um, Ilyakov thinks of them as an aspect of social consciousness. What's at stake in that uh, debate, right? <laughs> um, and um, because of his anti innatism I think it, a lot is at stake for Ilyenkov. It's very important mm -hmm. to him not to think of of the human mind as fixed and constrained by um, a merely material structure, merely material mm -hmm. structures. Um, but um, as long as you've got a rich sense of thinking beings coming to be through their initiation into culture, Ilyenkov, Ilyenkov could say, look, it's it's an empirical question for cognitive science to work out what the, you know, <laughs> if there are categorical structures that are innate in the brain, then okay, fine. But he doesn't, in the, the, the debate he's in okay. testing, he's not going to say that because he knows where that style of thinking goes in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to go there. Um, he wants to press the the social constitution of mind because he wants the Soviet Union to take responsibility for creating the conditions in which all of its citizens can flourish. That's the sort yeah. of message that he's constantly pressing. Um, uh, and so for him, it's not just an academic debate about mental structures and modules. It's it's something yeah. much richer in terms of uh, political culture of Soviet socialism. Really. Yeah, that, that, that's how I read him as well, you know, and it should be possible to reconcile both both Kant and, and the way Ilyenko sees the, the form of categories of thinking, I, I believe. Really. Yeah, that may very well be. be so, I mean, so similar thoughts in Vygotsky as well. I mean, it's just, look, you you unless you have these categorical Unless you have these categories in play, you're not a self-conscious, rational right. being understanding <laughs> that relation to the world. But the story about how they get into play, mm -hmm. that's a different question. And so exactly. it's not, um, uh, but you know, no, none of these questions are innocent. And so Ilyenkov is <laughs> very concerned not to get drawn into a kind of mm. natist, inna innatist view that would go hand in hand with a version of, of human nature as setting significant yeah. constraints on the possibility of human development to go back to the Diego's initial question. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah. <laughs> finally, back to Karina. Thank you, David. It's been a very enlightening conversation. I wanted to um, flag up one thing. Um, the question that Ivan raised about 
Plato, I think, is very important in relation to the last part of the discussion because um, thinking about thought uh, was a, a crime that Ilenka committed and for which he was given a very hard time. So I, the question of Plato is actually um, what, what is philosophy about? What, why do we even have philosophy? What does it matter? That, that's the, I think the behind his desire to elevate Plato. And in that sense, um, he's not, he's not a Western, he's neither a Western nor an Eastern philosopher. He's a philosopher's philosopher, you could say. And I, I think that's, it's rather important to understand that now, now that we're thinking about the um, whole question of the Soviet Union and Russia and what they were and what they are and whether or not there is, there was a, um, you know, whether Ilyenko was purely a Russian philosopher. And I think some of the um, comments that um, have come into the chat as well from, um, for example, from Andres about this Polish dimension and also we're beginning to understand the Ukrainian dimension, we're understanding other dimensions that, and influences that Ilyenko had um, beyond the limited views that people have had of what is philosophy and what is Russian philosophy, what is Soviet philosophy. So I think that's why it's more, it's, it, I think this is part of the Renaissance really, that um, understanding him in a, in a truly um, more global way that we've never been able to do really until now. So that, I, I think, it, David, you've, been, you've started something that you has <laughs> gone out of your control. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, another thing that is out of my control is my wife just reminded me that I'm supposed to be somewhere else. <laughs> so, <I didn't. laughs> um, okay. I, I, so I'm going to thank you very much. I agree very much with what you just said, Karina. I'm, I'm sorry to cut. But well, we run. have to finish anyway. So Yeah, exactly. So thank you, everybody, very much. I greatly enjoyed having the chance. Can, can I ask one quick question? Can you do well. another session with us in January? Uh, or February? Sure, yeah. if, you'd, if you'd like that, I'm sure yeah. I could. You talked into it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to run. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.